Jack. This was our Friday date. We try to do this at least once a week, and I think we managed to stick to that average. We were at one of our favorite places, a Mexican restaurant and bar called El Guapo's. They had a really nice outdoor patio, and the weather was perfect. Cool but not cold, slightly windy. We struck up a conversation with the guy at the next table. It was just one of those things that happened. He was alone, but seemed pleasant enough. He said his name was John. We chatted with him about our plans for the future and when we would have enough savings to put a down payment on a house. If things remained as they were now, in a year or so, we would have enough money. This was phase one of the plan. Stage two is creating your own capital. Stage three was a big house. Stage four is children. We were young and we had time. We are Jack Andrews and my wife, Jill. Save the jokes. We've heard them all. We had a whole shelf of Jack and Jill-themed memorabilia in our apartment from well-meaning friends and family members. We got married two years ago and have been living in marital bliss ever since. All we had now was our one-bedroom love nest, but it was ours. We didn't have the latest cars, but they were reliable and, more importantly, paid for themselves. We didn't have the biggest TV, but it worked well enough for us. Our furniture wasn't the newest or fancy, but it was clean and well cut. I just made a comment like this. So if all goes well, we should be able to start putting buns in the oven in about five years or so. John replied, perhaps I can move this schedule forward a little. Like this? Several years ago, I was very lucky in business. I am able to offer you a very good deal. And what kind of deal will this be? Before I answer this question, Google me. John Albright. This should prove my integrity. Jill took out her phone and looked. You have your own Wikipedia entry. God, it says that you have a net worth that. This is probably outdated. I'm close to $10 billion now. Fine. So what's the deal? Even though we just met, I like you guys and I want to help you. So I'll give you $1 million. This is after taxes, so the actual amount would be $1.4 million. But there's something I want. I waited for the other shoe to drop. I want Jill for the weekend. I was stunned. What? This is serious? I looked at Jill. I can only assume that the look of stunned disbelief on her face was reflected on mine. Fuck off, moron. Go back to your table and leave us alone. This is a serious proposal. She leaves her phone and purse and leaves with me. I will return it by 6 p.m. on Sunday and deposit the money into your account at that time. As long as she is with me, she will do whatever I want. I promise I won't harm her or leave any marks on her. Fuck you. My answer is no. I'll go stand by the door and wait five minutes while you discuss everything. If she doesn't join me by then, I'll leave and you'll never see me again. He stood up and walked to the exit, leaning against the wall. God, can you believe the arrogance of this asshole? No, I cannot. I know that the rich live differently, but this is a completely different level of aspiration. She paused. But a million bucks would be nice. I mean, we could move to phase four immediately. We'll buy a house with cash, fund college for our kids, and still have enough money left over to invest. We could retire at 40. Don't tell me you're actually considering this option. Of course not. I'm just saying it would be great. I looked at her. Fine, because if you did, it would destroy us. Don't be funny. I will never do anything that can harm our relationship. I looked at her again. I saw John watching us. He tapped his finger on his wristwatch. Well, I don't want to stay here anymore. Let's go home and watch a movie or something. Fine. Take care of my things. I need to go to the toilet urgently. I watched as she headed towards the toilets. She stopped to say something to John, no doubt reprimanding him again. Suddenly, they walked out the door together. I felt my heart clench for a second, and then I took off and ran out the door. I saw her get into the Mercedes. Just as she was about to close the door, I shouted her name. Jill, do not do that. She looked at me, mouthed sorry, and then closed the door. The car left the parking lot. 
I ran after her thinking I could jump on top of him or something, when suddenly I was grabbed from behind. I turned around and saw one of the largest men I had ever seen grab me by the shoulders. Let me go. This is my wife. Sorry, buddy, but Mr. Albright doesn't want any trouble. I watched as the car pulled out of the parking lot and drove away at a very high speed. I tried to break free and follow them, but I couldn't. He had an iron grip. I watched the taillights disappear into the distance, just like my marriage. If I let you go, will you do something stupid? I should point out that she was not forced in any way. I looked at him. What would you do if it were your wife? I would beat the crap out of him, of course. That's why he sent me here to hold you for a while. But now they're gone, so I'm letting you go. I stood there for a second. The bodyguard waited, then got into his car and drove away. Jill. Fine. Take care of my things. I need to go to the toilet urgently. I hated deceiving him, but I knew he would never agree. I headed towards the toilets, but stopped when I approached John. Let's go before I change my mind and before Jack makes a scene. John turned and walked out the door. I followed him. There was a Mercedes waiting right outside. John sat in the driver's seat. I opened the passenger door, but before I could get in, I heard Jack scream, Jill, do not do that. There was a mixture of surprise and offense on his face. I stopped for a second, then said, Sorry, got into the car and closed the door. It hurt that I hurt him, but I did it for us. John immediately took off. Don't worry, he said. He'll survive this. I hope so. I tried to get Jack out of my mind. So where are we going? I have a house outside the city. We'll spend the weekend there. The rest of the trip passed in silence. We drove for about an hour, heading out of town. Soon enough, we left the main highway and drove along a series of narrow country roads. Eventually, we arrived at the gate. John pressed a button on the remote control, and the gate opened. We drove along the gravel driveway for about a minute, then pulled up to a fairly large stone house. It was two stories high and looked as if it had been there a long time ago. We parked the car at the entrance. This used to be a hunting lodge. I purchased it and the surrounding land a couple of years ago and made several improvements, said John. Come inside. The interior was quite rustic. The door led into a hallway that connected to a large office. We went to the kitchen. John opened the door to another short hallway that reminded me of a hotel hallway. This impression was reinforced when John opened the first door on the right and walked inside. This is where you will live, he said. These are premises for kitchen staff and other service staff. It was a small windowless room built from cinder blocks painted an off-white color. The room contained a bed, a chest of drawers, and a desk. The bed was a bare mattress. There was an open closet against the wall with nothing in it. Next to the closet was the bathroom. John opened the top drawer of the dresser and pulled out a folded piece of what looked like fabric. I want you to go to the bathroom, take off all your clothes and put them on. All clothing, including underwear and shoes. He handed me the package. I looked at him. He made a motion with his hand, sending me to the bathroom, so I went in and closed the door. The bundle was not made of cloth. It was some kind of opaque white plastic, possibly Tyvek. It was similar to a jumpsuit, except it was completely form-fitting, with mittens built into the sleeves and booties on the legs. Okay, that was weird, but whatever. I undressed, then put on my overalls. There was a zipper on the front. I zipped it up to the crotch between my tits and then walked out. So do you like it? John walked over, grabbed the zipper, and pulled it all the way up to his neck. That's better. Then he went into the bathroom and collected all my clothes. Clean clothes will be returned to you on Sunday before departure. There are more bunny costumes in the dresser if you need to change. They are disposable. Throw them in the trash when you take them off. The chest of drawers also contains sheets and a blanket. He stepped closer to me, invading my personal space. Are you ready for your first... He smiled. Assignment? I nodded, terrified of what would happen next. Clean this room and a bathroom. 
It's been a few months now, and this place isn't in the best shape. What? Do the cleaning. There are cleaning products in the bathroom cabinet and a broom in the closet. I hope the floors are clean enough to eat off of. You understood? Do you want me to clean the room? And that's all? Yes, that's all for now. When you're done, you can make your bed and go to bed. If you get hungry later, there are sandwiches in the kitchen. I stared at him. Come on, chop chop, time is wasted. Get down to business. Then he turned and walked out, taking my clothes and closing the door behind him. What else could I do? I started cleaning the bathroom. There was dried urine on the toilet. There was a black ring around the bathtub. The lamps were covered in water stains. There was mold on the walls of the bathtub. It took me about an hour to clean the bathroom. Luckily, the room itself wasn't too bad. I just needed to dust the table and dresser, sweep the floor, and then wipe it down with a damp cloth. This place was shining. When I finished, I made the bed. I was more exhausted than I thought. As soon as I was done, I showered, then climbed into bed naked and fell asleep. The next thing I remember is being woken up by a knock on the door. Wake up! Get dressed! Let's get out of here! Now we get to the real business! At first I was confused, then I remembered. I was at John's. Okay, I'll go out now. I looked into the chest of drawers. There were dozens of bunny costumes, so I grabbed one and put it on, making sure to zip it all the way down. To the kitchen, said John. He was sitting at the table. Make us breakfast. Can you cook an omelet? Yes. Let's. The pantry and refrigerator were full of food, so I made a couple of omelets. Lots of cheese, bell peppers, mushrooms, and some ham. I put the omelets on plates, then placed one in front of John and sat at the end of the table to eat mine. Looks appetizing, he said, and started eating. We finished our meal in silence. When he finished, he said, clean it up here. When you're done, join me outside. And left. To say I was puzzled would be an understatement. I expected to be some kind of sex slave, not a kitchen charwoman. But it doesn't matter. The longer I can put off breaking my wedding vows, the better. I loaded the plates and silverware into the dishwasher and cleaned the pan by hand. I finished and walked out the front door. John sat in an Adirondack chair, one of two, on the patio, with a small table between them. Okay. You didn't waste any time. Do you see this? He pointed to what looked like a handle with wheels. I realized it was a real lawn mower. He then pointed to the expansive courtyard. Mow the lawn. Wait a second, I answered. I thought I was here too, you know. You agreed to do whatever I wanted for fairly generous compensation. What I want you to do now is mow the lawn. If you do not want to abide by our agreement, you can leave at any time and forfeit your compensation. The gate is on that side. He pointed down the driveway. Or you mow the lawn. Your choice. I glared at him. I've mowed lawns before, but always with a powered lawn mower. I grabbed the mower, moved it to the grass, and started mowing. The lawn must have been at least half an acre, maybe more. Fortunately, it is not too overgrown. I pushed this thing all the way through, then turned back around. Over the next few hours, I mowed slowly, taking breaks, only to drink water and eat lunch, which I had to prepare myself. Every half hour or so, John would come out to check on my progress and then come back inside. By the time the sun started to set, I was hot, sweaty, and tired. But I got the job done. The bunny suit was like a portable sauna. I had already unzipped it all the way down to my belly button. I wheeled the lawnmower back to the front door where John was waiting. Good job. Go take a shower and change into your new bunny suit. When you're done, go to the kitchen and prepare dinner. There are steaks in the refrigerator. I like medium rare. He started to go back inside, then stopped. Oh, and zip it up. You look indecent. I looked down and noticed that one of my breasts was poking out of the suit. I had no idea how long she hung around like that. I zipped up and stomped back to my room. After my shower, I got dressed in a new bunny costume and went to the kitchen. There was no one there. I looked in the refrigerator and found two steaks that weren't there this morning. 
I also saw some mushrooms and vegetables in the drawer, but screwed that. He said steak, so that's all I was going to cook. I preheated the oven. When the steaks were ready, I stuck my head into the office and shouted, The supper is ready. I took out his steak and placed it on the table, then sat down to eat mine. A minute later, John sat down and ate his steak without comment. When he finished, he told me that when I finished cleaning the kitchen, I could go to bed. So I did. I took off my suit, climbed into bed, and quickly fell asleep. The next morning, I was woken up again by a knock on the door. Get up and get to work. Your last day of work. I got up and put on a fresh bunny suit. John was waiting in the kitchen. Prepare breakfast again. Same as yesterday. Breakfast and cleaning, the kitchen passed in silence. When I finished and turned on the dishwasher, John directed me to the room next to my bedroom. It was the same as my bedroom, but completely empty. I want you to paint this room. What? Paint the room. The closet contains paints, rollers, brushes, and a change of clothes. Only this room. Do a good job, and that will be the last task for the weekend. And don't paint over switches and sockets. Remove the caps and replace them when you're done. I looked at him incredulously. Paint the room? Are you kidding? Are you paying me for maintenance? And that's all? For now, yes. But get busy. You don't have much time. Then he left. I stood there for a second, then looked into the closet. There was a five-gallon bucket of sky-blue paint and a bunch of tools and supplies. I grabbed a mat and spread it on the floor. I found a screwdriver and removed the covers of the outlets and switches, then covered the outlets and switches themselves with duct tape. I poured some paint into the roller and got to work. It didn't take as long as I thought. The room wasn't that big, and there weren't any awkward parts that needed to be painted over. When I was done, I put the outlet covers back on, folded the napkin, and put all the supplies back in the closet. He said that this was my last task, so I went into the next room and took a shower. When I finished, I found that my clothes had been cleaned and laid out on the bed. I got dressed and went to look for John. He was in the office. Oh, here you are. I assume you painted everything? Yes. You said this was my last task? This is true. Are you ready to return to your husband now? You should know that he was very upset when you left. I know. I will make amends to him. I felt a sudden surge of guilt. My sweet husband didn't deserve what I did to him that night. He must be going crazy, imagining all sorts of things. My guilt intensified when I realized that this was the first time I had thought about him all weekend. The car should already be here. He walked out the front door and I followed him. While we were standing there, a Mercedes drove up. A bodyguard from the restaurant was driving. Hop in, he'll take you home. The money will be credited to your account by the time you get home. I opened the door, but before sitting down, I turned to him and asked, So what's with all the tasks? I assumed you wanted a sex slave or something like that. Don't be funny. You're an average, perfectly attractive woman, but with the snap of my fingers, I can get women you're not even close to, and for much less than a million dollars. It was more of a social experiment. Can I force the average married woman to leave me in front of her husband? How long will it take? I looked at him incredulously. Without answering, I got into the car and closed the door. The bodyguard silently drove me home. Not a word was spoken. When we arrived at the apartment, I got out of the car. He left. I went to the door and unlocked it. I was glad that my K worked. Jack, cute, I'm back. Where are you, Jack? I looked at the bodyguard. What would you do if it were your wife? I would beat the crap out of him, of course. That's why he sent me here to hold you for a while. But now they're gone, so I'm letting you go. I stood there for a second. The bodyguard waited for me to do something, then got into his car and drove away. Hey, Jack. If you leave, you need to pay your bill first. It was Mike, the restaurant manager. During the time we went there, we met many of the employees. Crap! Didn't you see what happened? My wife just left me. And you're worried about the score? Wow. Don't worry about it. I'll fix everything. Sorry. I would never have thought that she would do this. Yes, me too. Mike handed me her purse. She left it on the table. The phone was in the side pocket of my purse. 
thank you. Not sure what the hell I'll do now. Don't do anything too stupid. Go home. Think about it. Good idea. I don't remember how I got home. As soon as I closed the front door, everything suddenly collapsed on me. My wife has disappeared. My marriage collapsed. All the dreams and hopes we had were gone. I collapsed on the sofa and stared at the ceiling. All I could think was, she's gone. I don't know how long it was. I must have fallen asleep at some point because I opened my eyes and it was morning. At first I was confused as to why I was on the couch, but then the memories came back. The melancholy hit me again, just as hard. Then something else struck, anger. How dare she do this to us? She threw away everything we had for money. I held back my anger and pushed the sadness deep inside. Act now, hurt later. There's no way we can stay together after this. I had to meet with a lawyer on Monday, but there was still something I could do now. I had until Sunday evening. Firstly, finances. Paid off a joint credit card and then canceled it. Then the bank. I opened a new account in my name, transferring half of the savings account into it minus $2,000. I took the $2,000 in cash because I would need it. I also transferred half of my current account. Secondly, I needed a new place to live. I called my friend Pete. Pete had a lot of friends because he had a pickup truck. People always turned to him for help with moving. I told him what happened. What did she do? Gone. Just because some rich asshole waved a ton of money at her? Damn, it's so cold. I can't believe she could do this. Believe me, I'm still in shock. I need to find a place to live and get my junk out of the apartment before she gets back on Sunday. I'm thinking about that extended stay motel near the office. In no case. You can stay with me. How much crap do you need to move? Actually, not so much. Clothes, a few books and the like. I don't care about furniture. Okay, get ready. I'll take a few boxes and be with you as soon as I can. I packed a week's worth of clothes in a gym bag. The rest went into trash bags. Pete showed up with some boxes and we loaded them up with books and a few other miscellaneous things. I didn't care about anything in the kitchen. Silverware is cheap. All my belongings were packed into Pete's truck or my car. I looked around the apartment to make sure I had everything. I saw a photo of Jill and I at our wedding. This was one of my favorite photos of us. Was. I decided to be petty. I took the photo out of the frame, tore it in half, and placed the pieces on the coffee table next to Jill's purse. Then I took off my wedding ring and placed it on top. I thought for a second and decided to be very petty. We had a fireplace and a couple of logs for the fire. I took our wedding album from the shelf, opened it halfway, covered the log in the fireplace with it, and lit it. Then I followed Pete to his house. I wasn't very good company that night, but I wasn't trying to be. I know I watched a ton of TV, but I don't remember any of it. All I could think about was that my wife left me to sleep with a billionaire for money. I finally took a dose of NyQuil and fell asleep. I woke up late on Sunday. I felt better physically, but emotionally, I was broken. Pete kept trying to engage me in conversation, but I wasn't feeling it. I thought about drinking, but I knew it wouldn't solve anything. Finally, my phone rang. I saw that the call was from Jill and sent it to voicemail. I didn't want to talk to her at all. Then she sent me a message. I'm back. Please call me. We need to talk. Nothing happened. Nothing. Yes, exactly. And even if it was true, it didn't matter. She left me, ready for anything. Then I remembered something. I turned on my laptop. Jill. He wasn't in the living room. I went to the bedroom. He wasn't there either. Then I saw an open closet. His things were gone. No, no, no. He left. I ran back to the living room and looked for a note or something. Then I saw the coffee table and collapsed on the sofa. It was our wedding photo, torn in half, with Jack's wedding ring on top. I don't know how long I sat there. It could have been a minute, or it could have been an hour. Then I realized that I had to find Jack. I had to tell him that nothing happened. I grabbed my phone and called him. The message went straight to voicemail. I left a message. Jack, honey, where are you? Please call me. We need to talk. I love you. Then I sent him a message. I'm back. Please call me. We need to talk. Nothing happened. Nothing. I looked around the room. Some bookshelves were empty. 
He took his books. He moved out. Then I saw the fireplace. It looked like this. No, no, no. Our wedding album. It was half burned. No, this can't be true. I have to talk to him. Jack. Then I remembered something. I turned on my laptop. I went to the bank's website and looked at the general account. A new deposit of $1.4 million was made into the savings account. I transferred $700 thousand to my new account and logged out. If my marriage is broken because of money, I will get my half. Epilogue They looked at each other over the conference table in the lawyer's office. The lawyers had just left, allowing them to talk privately. Jill, you said you would sign the divorce papers if I talked to you. Here I am. Speak. It was the first time they had spoken to each other, since that night at the restaurant. Jack, I don't want a divorce. Nothing happened. All he did was force me to do housework. I painted the walls in the room. I cleaned the bathroom. I mowed the lawn. I didn't do anything else. I didn't do anything remotely sexual. I didn't break my vows. You do not understand. You left me in a restaurant thinking you were going to have sex with him. It doesn't matter whether you had anything with him or not. You left me there with the intention of cheating on me. That's all that matters. I understand. You are right. I will never be able to make amends to you. But I have to ask. Please let me try. I love you. We can get through this. I know we can. Love is not a problem. Despite everything, I still love you. Jill looked at him hopefully. But, he continued, I can't trust you anymore. Who says you won't make some other major unilateral decision in the future? I mean, if you agreed to sleep with a guy for money, what else are you going to do if you think it's good for us? I'm sorry, Jill, but I can't get past this. Please sign. The ratio is 50-50. I took everything I wanted from the apartment and already took half the money. Sign and we're done. With these words, Jack stood up and left. Jill sat in silence for a while. She grabbed a pen and signed the papers in front of her. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, 